Hey, Matt. Hi, Jason. How are you? Thanks. Good. I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for coming on. Do you prefer Matt or Matthew? Oh, you can call me call me Matthew. Yeah. Yeah. Matthew. Okay. Yeah, so. so we have uh, Matthew Skick here. Um, and where where are you located? So I, I currently live in Moorestown, New Jersey. So just across the river from Philadelphia. And, uh, and so oh, it's because I work at the Museum of the American Revolution in, in Philadelphia. Okay. And you settled down in New Jersey. Yes. Uh, my, my wife and I uh, just bought a house uh, uh, just about a month ago now. So it's our first home. And we found a nice home built in 1935 here, here in Morristown, right in, right in town. Nice historic town. <laughs> nice. 1930s. I bet that's pretty cool architecture. Yeah, it's 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 pretty neat. Uh, it did have uh, uh, some renovations done in 2017, so it's got an updated kitchen and that and that sort of thing. But uh, it still has a little bit of that 1930s charm with some archways and a nice stone fireplace. Uh, so it, we're very pleased with it. Yeah, those archways are you know just a giveaway when you're looking at what the 30s and 40s. That's right. Yep, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, we, I wanted to start off as we were chatting prior to recording. I wanted to, I wanted to go back a little ways and um, talk a little bit about your leap into history and material culture. Was this something that even back, to, you know, back into pre-college or in high school you were interested in, or what, did that get fostered later? Or? It goes back even farther than that. So really, it's 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 really been my you know lifelong interest uh so the first books i learned to read with uh were about george washington I, yeah i remember in in first grade i was i had a, a discarded library book about uh that my dad picked up at a used bookstore about george washington and that's because i grew up in hopewell new jersey 10 minutes away from where washington crossed the delaware hmm. so going there as as a, as a little boy you know going to the park going to the site um, the little museum they had there. I became interested in antiques and uh, learning about uh, the story of, of Washington and, and the Continental Army during the Revolutionary War. And that really became my, my main interest. I just want to learn as much as I could about that time period and, and those people. Uh, and, you know, it, it really just kind of blossomed and, and, and snowballed from there. I was, you know, and, and lucky enough that my, my parents, you know, fostered that interest in me. And when, when we went on family vacations, we went to historic sites like Mount Vernon and went to battlefields. We, we uh, toured around up in, uh, in you know, upstate New York and went to places like Fort Ticonderoga. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really wanted to go to as many museums as I could, uh, as many historic sites uh, as I could. And, uh, my brother and sister went along for the ride too, even though I was the youngest. But uh, they had some interest in history, but not not quite as much as me. But uh, uh, so it started early. And growing up in the area, I did. I was not too far away from uh, Trenton, New Jersey, where mm -hmm. uh, the old barracks museum is a great great museum, a French and Indian War barracks that also was uh, used in part during the Revolutionary War. And I attended there summer day camp uh, as a as a 9 10 11 year old each each summer you know one week i was there learning how to be a continental soldier uh, <laughs> and i eventually became one of the founding members of their fife and drum corps that okay. they started and uh, i wanted to spend as much time as i could at, at, at places like the old barracks museum and i wow. also got my first job as a historical interpreter at age 16 um, when i uh, was hired by the New Jersey State Park Service as a seasonal employee uh, working at Washington Crossing State Park, where I really got, wow. got my start. And uh, uh, so I was, uh, as a high schooler, I was talking to people about, um, you know, common soldiers of the Revolutionary Era, leading school tours for 300 fifth graders, um, <laughs> and just having a blast. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, you were just, you primed for getting into to college years for what you what you what your passions were and what you wanted to do did you... yes that's okay. that's right i in i remember in middle school uh we had a 
an essay that we had to write for English class. And it was, you know, what a typical essay that you essay prompt is, you know, what you wanted to do uh, in, in college and afterwards for a career. And um, you had to interview somebody that uh, was in that career path uh, at the time. So I remember I, I said, I, I want to be a museum curator. Yeah, you know, I was the only one in my class that said that, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, uh, and I, I uh, interviewed the, the local uh, museum curator at the Hopewell Museum and learned a little bit about what she did and wrote that up in an essay and still have that essay. And, and I look back on it now and I'm curator of exhibitions at the Museum of the American Revolution. I'm very pleased with, with uh, that uh, I, I was able to achieve, achieve that dream yeah. and uh, I'm very pleased with, with where I am, so. Do you remember? If, do you remember that curator's name? I wonder if you could track her down and say, "Hey." <laughs> yeah, she. She. I. I. I do remember her name. I believe she has passed away since. Uh, mm. But uh, it, it's the museum is still open, still there. You know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it was a, a fun little interview that I did. <laughs> so you eventually you get through um, sort of the the typical. Um, college years, you study history, and then then you and and then you. Um, how did the Winterthur program uh, work? I mean, how did you get into that? And sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. When I when I did my undergraduate work I, at American University in Washington D.C., I studied history, and and I really wanted to be down there to uh, do some internship opportunities. I really had my sights set on interning at the National Museum of American History. And uh, I hope to do that my junior year of, of undergrad. And um, I did some volunteer work at the National Archives freshman and sophomore year just to get some museum experience under my belt before I did that internship. And uh, I really wanted that, that internship to get some hands-on experience in collections management and, and curatorial work um, because I, ha I had a little bit of that experience from my uh, my job at Washington Crossing Park, working with the collection there, but I mm -hmm. wanted to get a little bit more of that because I did have my sights set on applying for the Winter Tour program in American material culture. So that that fellowship that Winter Tour offers for uh, a two-year fellowship for uh, eight students each year. And uh, so my experiences at the Smithsonian, I did two internships, one collection management, one curatorial, got me some hands-on experience working with the, um, uh, it, within the division of home and community life. And my supervisor there was uh, curator uh, Tim Winkle. And, uh, and also I had another supervisor, Bonnie uh, Lilienfeld. And they both instilled in me a lot of uh, hands-on uh, training in terms of housing objects, uh, also, I worked closely with a collection of uh, ceramics, uh, transfer printed creamware. So I was writing object labels and descriptions for about a collection of a, a hundred, uh, about a hundred uh, pieces in, in their uh, in their storage. So yeah, they they gave me a lot of uh, free range to kind of develop these skills that I could uh, could um, put in my application for for Winter Tour. And uh -huh. I had first learned about Winter Tour uh, back in high school actually. And it was through an antiques uh, dealer uh, that I knew. And I told him of my interests in history and, and material culture. And, and he said, oh, you should consider eventually applying for the, the Winter Tour program. And that was the first I had ever heard of it. Mm -hmm. And um, so I looked into it a little bit more and it was exactly what I was hoping to do. You know, it was, it was hands-on experiential learning with the, the, the famed collection at, at Winter Tour, mm -hmm. uh, focusing on early America. Um, it was, it checked all the boxes for me. And mm -hmm. it, it was it was in Delaware, it wasn't too too far away from where I wanted to be eventually. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I applied, I, I really emphasized my my you know passion, my my dedication to the field and uh, my, my experiences with, with my internships and um, and so I was brought on to, to, in, to interview weekend and, and, and made it through, through that and was brought on as a fellow. 
And uh, so I started at Winter Tour in the summer of 2014, right out of right after I had graduated from undergrad at American. Mm. And so my experiences at, at Winter Tour were just uh, unbelievable. You know, mm. it not only did it offer opportunities to study with the collection and, and really as I went to Tofrel, you you kind of get the keys to to the museum, uh, and you get to be, be in there basically whenever you want, and have mm-hmm. access to the amazing library collection there. Um, but you also get travel opportunities uh, to go to. Uh, we went to England. We went to uh, the American South. We studied up in New England, and uh, went to Antiques Week, uh, Americana Week in New York City in uh, uh, 2016. Mm. So. Uh, by the time I graduated in May of 2016, I was really, you know, proud to be associated with that program, and it and it set me on a on a, on a great path, you know, kind of kind of armed me with a, a, a great knowledge of a variety of materials from ceramics and silver and, and furniture to textiles, mm-hmm. uh, and we got to learn directly from from the curators like Linda Eaton. Cur- the, uh, now a curator emeritus of, of textiles and and Wagner, um, we got to learn from the great furniture historian Brock Job, uh, and the the program instilled a lot of camaraderie amongst amongst the class that that you enter with and spend the two years with. Hmm. Uh, so it's great to learn from my my peers who had different interests in mind, but also some some similar interests. But it was great to be amongst peers that were. That had similar passion for for learning and, and a drive drive to learn. So it, it really fostered a, a, a great experience. Did you have a particular uh, specialty when you were there, or something that you you know? Um... Yeah. yeah. Sometimes uh, it, it, every student's a little different. So some people want to focus solely on furniture or focus solely on textiles, and some of that is is borne out in when when you decide what your your thesis topic is going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, and I chose a thesis topic that that no winter tour student had ever chosen before, which was studying firearms, historic firearms, which was uh, so a little bit of uh, multi uh, multimedia in, in terms of way of thinking about wood and iron and steel. So I actually worked with my uh, with Ann Wagner as my thesis advisor, who's curator of of, of metals uh, at winter tour. And so I studied. Philadelphia's gunsmiths during the Revolutionary War to mm-hmm. understand more about how their careers were transformed by uh, the eight year eight years of war uh, and how they changed from civilian producers to military contractors uh, making um, making muskets and and other firearms for the Continental Army and uh, American militias and then how that experience during the war. Uh, uh, set them up for future relationships with the new federal government and, and the eventual creation of the first two federal armories at Springfield and Harper's Ferry. And it was Philadelphia gunsmiths that had experience during the Revolutionary War that helped establish those two armories and, and, and build America's first armory system uh, in, the, in, the, in the late 1790s. Uh, hmm. So that was a, a story that I thought, you know, could could have used more treatment and more um, study. It was a, really a focused on the the people behind the, the materials, uh, that the people who made uh, these these firearms. So I got a chance to to study uh, with uh, some of the great private collectors of of of, of historic firearms. Um, learned from Eric Goldstein down at Columbia Williamsburg. Um, and and really get a, a good sense and, and specialty in that regard in, in firearms history. Um, and of course, my, the training I used, I, I developed at Wintertour was extremely useful to to this study. Um, and uh, I'm really happy with how the how the product turned out. Do you think um, Do you think that uh, level of the the specialty that you were that you were aligned with. Um, do you think that um, helped propel your career forward? Or, definitely, definitely. or 
the sometimes the count counter push is to be a more of a generalist and that opens up your opportunities for for a career path if you know a little bit about a lot of different things of course i'm not saying that you don't but it seems like that's that's the specialty track that you've been on um, can you speak a little bit more about that yeah, sure yeah that's that's something that was on my mind as a as an undergraduate and a graduate student is is am i kind of pigeonholing myself a little bit too much in terms of you know the, the the American Revolution and the 18th century is is what I what I love to study. Uh, it's what, what I'm so passionate about. But um, you know, what if I can't get a job in that in that field? Because there's only so many opportunities in that. You know, am I am I am I becoming too much of a specialist in this and not branching out uh, enough? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, if I felt like, you know what, I, I want to make sure that I'm, people can consider me a, sort of an expert in this part of the field. And I thought that that would be, uh, provide more value to what I wanted to do. Um, and so I decided to, to kind of just stick stick with this and, and really bec you know, become as much of a, an expert as I could in this. And there's still so much to learn about this, this one topic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I, hopefully I can, um, continue to uh, learn more and more, but I, I also have uh, learned from my experience at, at, at Wintertour, for example, and even my undergraduate work is that, you know, there's, I'm, both of those experience, experiences uh, provided me with the, the tools and the resources to, if I do ever need to, um, you know, become more of a, a generalist or learn or become a specialist in something else, I know where I can turn to uh, to do that, like I can, um, I have you know built a, a professional network that I can turn to to others for assistance and advice if I'm if I'm looking to learn more about something I don't know know much about. Uh, I can um, develop uh, new skills based on um, the scholarship that I've read in in my graduate and, and undergraduate uh, classrooms. So. Um, yeah. I feel like I have this skill set to to learn something new if if necessary, uh, and uh, in a completely different topic if if necessary. Yeah, um, of course. Um, the, 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 the the words we're throwing around, you know, specialist and general. I mean, it's somewhat relative. I mean, it, 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 at a at a particular institution, uh, we might think flatware is a is a is a specialty. Yeah, but it's maybe a for a general because uh, you're you know into uh, spoons or you know <laughs> or different right. types of flatware, which could be a sub specialty of exactly of it. So it's a little bit right. relative. I mean, there's probably so many specialities within the 18th century and the Revolutionary War time period that you know Definitely. branches out in a, little, a million different tendr tendrils. Exactly. I, I kind of consider myself a, a generalist in terms of the American Revolution, you know, uh, uh, it, uh, in terms of uh, in this time period. But uh, with a little bit of, you know, I have a, a you know, deeper dot can dive deeper into certain aspects of, of the time period, especially in terms of material culture. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not the expert on, you know, this one battle, for example, like I, I, uh, I'd have to do a little bit more studying to give a battlefield tour of this one battle compared mm -hmm. to other experts who know, know that that battle extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, just as an example there. Um, so yeah, it, it is, it is a bit relative. <laughs> and how long, how, how long have you been with the Museum of the American Revolution? I was hired by, by the museum in uh, June of 2016. So one month after I, I graduated from winter tour. Wow. Uh, and so I, I started there uh, about, what is that, seven or eight months before the museum actually opened to the public, uh, which, and the museum opened to the public in April, on April 19th, 2017. So we're coming up on. So you were um, very much years. involved with the, the preparations for, to, to get the collections ready for the opening and afterwards. Oop, I have a little bit of a lag, Matt, Matthew. Exactly, yes. 
yeah, so um, one of the things that I was brought on to do, the museum had planned uh, for the, the core exhibit, the, the main exhibit. And um, the, uh, the thing that's, that I worked on were, were four digital touchscreen interactives that um, focused on, on different stories that we wanted to, to, to tell in the museum. Uh, I'll, just to give you one example, it's called, uh, it's called Finding Freedom, African-Americans in, in Wartime Virginia. And it focused on uh, five individuals of, of African descent, both free and enslaved, who were in Virginia in 1781 when the British and American armies were battling through uh, that state, uh, leading up to uh, Yorktown, the, the siege of Yorktown. And so this interactive explored their lives uh, in turn, almost like a digital storybook. Uh, so I work with uh, illustrators uh, and the interactive development uh, firm, Blue Cadet, to uh, kind, of, kind of resurrect these lives and, and the, the, the material world that they lived in, even though uh, little, little survived front to document their lives. Um, but their stories were based on primary source research that we did at the museum um, with some con consultation from, from other historians uh, to bring these stories uh, out and, um, and, and share uh, little known aspects of the experience of, of free and enslaved men and women in, in Virginia at this, at this point in time. So this is a, a really neat project to work on. Um, it helped me develop uh, skills in terms of digital liter literacy, um, in terms of, of, of user experience. Um, so it, it, these, these, these projects were really useful to me in, in my professional development and, I, and the products we created for the core exhibit were, were, uh, have been greatly uh, positively reviewed and, and, and now some of them are even being turned on to turn into um, online interactive so uh, mm. people around the world can access them. They don't just have to come to the Museum of the American Revolution to, to see them. Yeah. I, I think of um, a lot of people have been thinking about the museum there and, and sort of the genius behind the, the marketing efforts that have taken place since the since pre-opening, the anticipation, the opening, the tent, um, marketing material culture and in the right way is so crucial too in our in our profession that's it, right you've you've got to make it you got to make it cool and you got to make it uh people feel like wow yeah i want to get engaged with that uh right you know, i i the museum owes so much to uh some of our our leaders uh including uh uh, Scott Stevenson, who's now our president and CEO, and uh, Philip Mead, who's our chief historian and, and uh, curator. And both Phil and Scott were the ones that worked uh, very closely and, and, and kind of hand in hand on the developing the core exhibit and the stories that would be told uh, in, in the, the main exhibit of the Museum of the American Revolution. And uh, Scott worked uh, very closely with the uh, uh, film production team of uh, Donna Lawrence Productions out of Louisville, Kentucky to, to write the um, and produce the uh, George Washington's War Tent film and presentation uh, at the museum, which is our signature experience. Right. Um, and, you know, Scott had the had the, uh, the question of how do you, like you said, Jason, how do you make linen, a linen tent, interesting? How do you make it compelling? How do you make it Make it pe make people want to see it and, and learn more about it, mm -hmm. and um, by the, the way that the the film is written about telling the story not just of the of the tent during the Revolutionary War but the, the provenance the, the the history of the tent since the war and and up to this present day is a is a it's a the tent is a lens through which we can see the struggles and um, difficulties of of American history but the the fact that the United States survive, it survives is an amazing thing. This uh, experiment in liberty, equality, and self-government survives. And the tent is a, is a sort of a, a way of, of seeing how that survival has, has taken place. 
Um, so it's really, it's not just about the tent and the tent is not just a, a uh, an illustration of, of uh, George Washington, but it's, it's a, such an amazing connection to, um, it's an amazing connection to uh, American history in general uh, and the people stories behind um, behind uh, the, these art artifacts are what make them so compelling. And that's something we really emphasize at the Museum of the American Revolution. It's not just about the musket, but it's about the person that, that carried that musket. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's evidence of decision-making, it's evidence of taking a stand. These, these objects are also evidence of, of participating in a, a movement or a revolutionary movement in which nobody knew the outcome. Nobody knew what, that it was going to succeed, um, and uh, many people disagreed with it. Um, the uh, so it's the people's stories that are, are really at the heart of how we present artifacts uh, and material culture at the Museum of the American Revolution. Before we uh, head into the lightning round, can you, without giving too much away, is there a teaser that you could provide in terms of what what's next in terms of a blockbuster exhibit or something like that, that, hey, we should uh, keep our ears out for this next thing. Sure, yeah. I, I uh, What's coming up is um, this fall in uh, October of 2021, uh, I'm curating the exhibit Liberty, Don Troiani's Paintings of the Revolutionary War. Uh, this is exhibit is going to be the first uh, ever uh, exhibit of uh, the military historical military artist Don Troiani's uh, paintings of the Revolutionary War. And Don's works uh, can be seen at you know, in dozens and dozens of National Park Service sites on interpretive panels. Uh, you, you'll you encounter them at Civil War battlefields, at Revolutionary War battlefields, at, and at other historic sites. His his paintings are all over the place because he is really dedicated to authentically recreating what the Revolutionary War, what the Civil War uh, kind of truly looked like. Uh, hmm. And uh, he is very respected for that based on his research process, the fact that he has a, a major collection of, of, of artifacts from the, these periods that inspire his paintings, that he does a lot of primary research and, and, and kind of brings these stories and, and little known aspects of the Material culture and and um, and history of of his battle paintings and soldier studies uh, to life for the first time. They're almost like reading an they're almost like a an article, like reading a historical article, wow. um, but it through a painting, um, because they have so many messages that they they send and um, so much research goes behind them. And so this exhibit will bring together forty five of Don Triani's original works. Uh, most people have never seen the original canvases and, and watercolors that Don Don paints, mm -hmm. and the they will be on loan from a variety of private collectors, alongside uh, about forty objects from uh, Don Troiani's collection, his personal collection, and also the museum's collection, along with a few other lenders, because these these objects uh, that survive from the period and the, then Troiani's paintings. Um, work kind of are in conversation with each other uh, mm. about uh, how this is another way you can learn about the story of the uh, Revolutionary War and see the human struggle aspect of, of the war, uh, you know, in an era, you know, 50 years before photography. Uh, so we don't have photographs of the American Revolution the paintings and, and eyewitness images that survive are sometimes uh, hard to understand or hard to connect with. Mm -hmm. But uh, Don Troiani's paintings uh, are, are raw or dramatic and really bring out these, uh, the fact that this, the American Revolution is not just a, a fantasy that was 250 years ago. It's real people making real choices uh, with, with real consequences that we still feel today. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for that, that little bit of a teaser. Yeah. My yep. pleasure. <laughs> um, all right. So you ready for the lightning round? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so you have to choose one. Uh, bumper cars or go-karts? Go-karts. Okay. Go-karts. 
especially with your partner there, you're going to, you, uh, you'd beat her in a race. Yeah, I think you know, she's pretty, she's got, she drives pretty fast. So it'd be tough. <laughs> um, uh, cribbage or poker? Cribbage. Big fan yeah. of cribbage. Yeah, not, not, that's a it's sort of a lost art form playing cribbage. It is. That's something I learned from uh, my wife, Kelsey. She taught me how to play and we play all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it. It. it uh, I mean, it's quite an old game, but it was popular in the 18th century, right? It, it was. It was. Yep. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, <laughs> this one's going to be easy. I, well, I don't know. Could be difficult. Uh, <laughs> you you can fire you can fire a uh, rifle from the Civil War, a musket from the Revolutionary War. <laughs> <laughs> well I, I would definitely definitely i've done both but i would definitely pick really straight war so, <laughs> so. How, can you tell us uh, br- uh briefly like what what the feeling is so the, fi- the different feelings of firing a different a different weapon yes yeah, so i've 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 fired you know reproductions of 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 British muskets of, of French muskets, uh, rifle, etc. from, from the revolutionary era. I've done the same, same thing with the civil war, um, um, firearms. I've even fired a Gatling, Gatling gun. Uh, so, uh, yeah, each one's a little different, but the, um, and the ignition ignition system is, is sort of the, the, the biggest, it is the biggest difference, um, okay. in terms of percussion versus flintlock. And I like the, the, the feel of the flintlock. There's a there's a slight, um, very the slightest bit of delay between pulling the trigger and and firing. I, I kind of like the uh, the feeling of of that. So it's like a yeah. little anticipate uh, anticipation there uh, that I like. So so is it? I mean, is there a little bit of are there are there any myths or you know miss you know just misunderstandings in terms of you always hear about oh the musket it was you know all over the place and then the rifle came along and I mean is this is this a historical like do people just repeat that over and over again and is there yeah yeah it's something we talk we talk about quite a bit uh at at the museum and when people have questions about firearms they see on display you know they they see a musket and they say oh that's why you know wildly inaccurate and and a kind of a useless uh battlefield firearm but Uh um in fact, that, that the muskets were the, the core um, firearm of the, the armies of the day. Uh, mm-hmm. Rifles were were expensive to, to, to make. They took, a, took longer to make the muskets. Um, so when you're arming uh, thousands of troops, it's it's much easier to to produce and, and cheaper to uh, produce muskets. Mm-hmm. Um, but rifles of the period typically didn't carry bayonets, and oftentimes bayonets were used as uh, to um, push an enemy from the field, uh, uh, you know, so whereas a, a lot of American r- uh, riflemen of the Continental Army are being forced to retreat when they're struggling to reload their, their rifles without a bayonet, the mm. British Light Infantry are charging forward at them with their m- muskets and bayonets to drive them from the field. Mm. Um, so muskets can fire three to four shots a minute, a rifle can fire about one, a one shot a minute. So it, it's, there's a lot of uh, drawbacks mm. to rifles of the period, but of course, when uh, rifled muskets come out and, and loading is is enhanced, and then with the advances of the Industrial Revolution, you know, muskets just become obsolete. Yeah, yeah. so it's it, you can more easily produce rifles, uh, at, and with with uh, new technology, new new machines. Um, but uh, in the 18th century, uh, a musket is is a uh, very useful tool for the militaries. Um, rifles are, are have their uses as well because they struck a lot of fear in the British Army, and they developed their own rifles to counteract uh, the American riflemen. Uh, mm. But uh, uh, yeah, musket was definitely yeah uh, definitely go. an important thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Matthew, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you for having me, Jason, uh, and uh, uh, I. Be happy to to talk more about this in, in in the future, and I hope more people can come to the Museum of the American Revolution and and see our our future uh, projects that we're working on, future exhibits, and also go on our website to see some of our uh, our online offerings too. Yeah, cool. All right. Well, you have a good rest of your day. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Bye. All right. Bye.